Welcome to this episode of The Common Sense Skeptic, where we are taking on the topic of Mars colonization. Namely, what kind of society we believe colonists might be living in, and a couple of specific examples of which ones they definitely will not. In part one, we covered the selection process undertaken by the U.S. Navy when assessing persons for submarine crews. Then we compared that to Musk's intention of allowing anybody to go to Mars, whether or not they could even afford the ticket up front. In part two, we're going to distill what we believe might be the societal structures of both the spaceship on their trip over to Mars, and then again for society on the surface within the colony, while providing the reasoning why we think these off-world societies might not be what you think. Some parts of this episode are going to be very blunt, very black and white, and so is the extreme nature of space. Some people will not appreciate the binary choices being made here. However, lives will hang in the balance of every decision, and when that balance can be tipped into chaos in three meals, as Lennon claimed, that will leave no room for gray. Let's take a minute to think about what an onboard ship society would look like. What criteria would you be applying to the people and crew structure you're bringing along? First off, the vessel they would be traveling on would require a crew. Crew on board any craft has a hierarchy and a chain of command. Notably, ships and planes have captains at the top, an XO underneath them whose job it is to step up or relieve the CO if the need arises, and a chain of command leading all the way down the ladder. It would, by necessity, need to be this way for an interplanetary ship that must be kept maintained and in order, where if things aren't working perfectly, they can be fixed quickly. That will require a crew that takes orders from their superior officers without question, and that means this society will not be a democracy. Musk has said over and over again that his starships, the 9 meter variation for those needing clarification, and this is straight from page 5 of the user's manual that's downloadable from SpaceX.com will carry 100 people per trip to Mars. We already know that Starship is woefully inadequate for carrying that many people, but for this exercise we are going to pretend it can. How would that 100 person roster break down? If we are comparing this spacecraft to a Navy vessel, it would have a captain or commanding officer who is ultimately responsible for all souls aboard. Their second in command is often called the executive officer or XO. Then department heads called chiefs would oversee their departments and report up the chain to the XO, then to the CO. Chief engineer, chief security, chief medical officer, whatever titles they have would have a roster of ranked personnel assigned to them. On cruise ships, which would closely mimic a pay-to-play colonial transport paradigm, the CO is the captain or master, the XO is called the staff captain, and the three major departments on board are the engine department, headed by the chief engineer, the deck department overseen by the ship's first officer, and the hotel department run by the hotel director. There is also the medical department headed up by a senior doctor, a baby doc, and nurses underneath them. All of these department heads have seconds in command who can step up in a moment's notice to perform as the department head. So that's almost two dozen people right there. Captain, their backup, doctor, their backup, their nurse, chief engineer, apprentice, deck officer and their replacement, hotel director with their alternate. If a senior officer becomes incapacitated, there is a clear chain of command that advances qualified people up the chain. And so far we haven't talked about cooks, housekeepers, mechanics, plumbers, electricians, etc. that would perform the other duties required to keep a personnel transport ship in operating condition. With that many people required to keep the ship operational and provide the expected services, you're cutting pretty deep into the number of passengers you're able to take per trip. Because if a transport ship is not kept ship shape, chaos can break out very quickly. Let's go back a couple of years and examine how quickly things can go from fantastic to foobar with an example from the cruise line industry. In 2013, the Carnival Vessel Triumph experienced an engine room fire that left the ship without power adrift off the coast of Alabama. As a result, the ship's vacuum toilet system stopped working, resulting in some sewage backing up throughout the cabins. 3,100 guests started freaking out, demanding refunds, overwhelming the 1,100 staff and crew with their discontent, while the ship's company was trying as best they could to get the situation under control. It took less than a day for people to become furious and hysterical, and the ordeal lasted four days. Anybody who has worked in the customer service, hospitality, or travel sectors will know this to be true. People who pay a fare will expect to be waited on hand and foot. They will expect meals to be prepared for them, quarters to be cleaned for them, entertainment to be provided for them. And every single one of them will believe in their own mind that they are the most important person on board. They are the customer, and the customer believes they are always right. The more somebody pays, the better they expect to be treated, which is another reason why selling tickets is a bad idea. 
that would definitely create a multi-tiered society aboard the ship. Do you hold a third-class ticket and that your presence here is no longer appropriate? However, people who are paid to take part in such an excursion and travel great distances to set up outposts will follow orders, contribute to the operations and repair of the ship, prepare their own meals, wash their own bedding, provide their own entertainment, as is the case aboard the ISS. So planners will have to make a choice. Do you sell tickets to passengers who will expect everything to be done for them and bitch and moan every chance they get, or assemble a crew who knows their jobs as well as when to either knuckle down and get the job done or stay clear so the proper crew can attend to it. Fact of the matter is, you could take a sub crew right off their boat today, seal them in a starship, and everyone would very quickly know their roles with a minimum of extra training. So colonial starships are much more likely to be run like a submarine than a recreational pleasure cruise. The first part of the selection process for persons wanting to go to Mars should absolutely be a similar testing as what we examined in part one of this series regarding submarine personnel. In fact, the test would need to be even more strict and selective to minimize those people who might fall through the cracks. And if we're being honest about this, a lot of people aren't going to be very happy about how the process would likely break down. In an enclosed human system rife with stress, you're going to want to remove as many sources of conflict as possible while at the same time trying to procure diversity and a wide variety of skill sets, each one of which would need to be covered by more than one person. It's probably fair to say that religion has been one of mankind's greatest double-edged swords. Providing people with a sense of structure, community, faith, and foundation has been undermined by many of the world's ideologies through the forced acceptance of their beliefs. It would stand to reason that different belief systems on the same mission could cause turmoil that might otherwise be avoided. But if you're thinking they could just load the ship up with a hundred atheists and be done with it, think again. Guaranteed at some point of this journey, when people's backsides are puckering up, people are going to be praying for help. It's probably a good idea to know ahead of time who they're going to be praying to, and if that is going to cause any conflicts. Now just to be absolutely clear here, the problem on board would not originate from a particular person's faith. Issues would arise from others being intolerant of that faith. And if anyone is thinking about adding any comments that are disparaging to any particular faith here, you will be proving our point. If the ultimate goal of colonization is to have a self-replicating fertile society where babies are being born not only to replace the population that die off, but also to grow the population over time, that is going to require mainly heterosexual fertile applicants. Given the amount of resources required to facilitate in vitro fertilization, they should be sticking with what works naturally. If it works on Mars at all, that is. There is a vigorous debate between experts whether or not human conception on Mars is even possible given the radiation and gravity concerns on the planet. And another ethical debate about whether or not it is morally acceptable to not only try having babies that could be born with mutations, but would not ever be able to leave the planet and return home to Earth with their parents. Just as there will likely not be resources for in vitro fertilization, we would not expect there to be neonatal ICU facilities for babies with a slim chance of survival. Meaning, as soon as there were noticeable defects in a developing fetus, it would be logical and necessary to terminate the pregnancy. We went looking for examples of birth defects caused by radiation from the nuclear bombs detonated over Japan and in the area surrounding Chernobyl. And some of those pics were so disturbing that we're just going to use these pics from Total Recall instead and say that these people got off lucky. Let's say they've worked out these medical and ethical debates, deciding to move forward and increase the population. If they want to diversify the gene pool as much as possible, strictly monogamous couples aren't necessarily the way to go. There would have to be a consensus balancing how important the nuclear family unit will be on Mars versus how quickly the population needs to grow. If the nuclear family is deemed more important, then monogamous couples would raise their own children. If colony growth is deemed more important, then the ratio of men to women would need to be altered with three or four females to every male, then each of those women coupling up with a different man on each pregnancy to maximize the diversity of the gene pool and avoid genetic breakdown. There is a Next Generation episode that had this as their plotline actually. Season 2, episode 18, it's called Up the Long Ladder. Three husbands. Uh-huh. Worth a watch if this kind of thing interests you, or if you're into washing women's feet. You generally start at the top and work your way down. Now we get to the skill set requirements. 
nobody going to Mars is going to be able to kick back and enjoy a relaxing stay, watching blue sunsets and taking day excursions to Olympus Mons. Everyone will have a role to play and they will be required to fill that role. And again, in a military or a paramilitary structure, those roles are predefined. With a mixed civilian population clambering aboard, planners would have to make sure that not only are all the roles filled, they are also covered by more than one person. Accidentally forgetting to hire a plumber or a doctor or a solar energy expert and a backup would be a fatal mistake. Musk has already tried to lay out the framework for a free and independent Mars. Where did he do this? Under Section 9 of the terms and conditions of his satellite internet company Starlink. He seriously thinks that by signing up for internet services with his company, that will require you to support his ambitions of becoming Imperator of Mars. Now just in case anybody is confused about all this, don't be. Musk has no business pretending he has any say in the matter, nor designating himself the Imperator of Mars as he states in his Twitter profile. It's just another example of his extreme megalomaniacy. To quote Section 9 of the Starlink Agreement, For services provided on Mars or in transit to Mars via Starship or other colonization spacecraft, the parties recognize Mars as a free planet and that no Earth-based government has authority or sovereignty over Martian activities. Accordingly, disputes will be settled through self-governing principles established in good faith at the time of Martian settlement. This is well and truly hilarious for a number of reasons. Here are just a few of them. In 1967, the spacefaring nations of the world entered into the Outer Space Treaty, which now has 110 state parties and 89 non-ratified signatory countries agreeing to several conditions regarding off-world activities. Of special concern at that point of the Cold War were the state parties that agreed not to place weapons of mass destruction around Earth nor any other celestial bodies. So that whole thing about Musk nuking Mars to terraform it, it was always pure bullshit. Big surprise. But the Outer Space Treaty also protects against national claims of ownership on any other celestial body, agreeing that space should be accessible to all countries and can be freely and scientifically investigated. Meaning, Musk can neither try to claim Mars, nor will he have any say in its planet-wide governance. Now, Muskrats are typically quick to point out that neither Musk nor any other private citizen nor company is signatory to this agreement, so he can do as he pleases. That is false. <laughs> Citizens are beholden to the laws created by their governments. Musk is a U.S. citizen, therefore he is beholden to the laws of the U.S. and the treaties the U.S. has entered into with other partner nations. The United States is responsible for keeping Musk in check under Article 6. The formal wording is, The activities of non-governmental entities in outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, shall require authorization and continuing supervision by the appropriate state party to the treaty. For those that are unaware, Musk and all of his ventures on and off planet are intricately tied to the US government. Every flight his vehicles make must be sanctioned by the Federal Aviation Administration. Musk has also received billions of dollars from NASA to develop various machines for NASA, including Crew Dragon. Even through Tesla, Musk benefits billions more with tax breaks, EV buyer incentives, and factories being built by the state for his companies to use. Even those internet satellites that he's losing money launching, whose terms of service he incorporated this nonsense into, require regulatory approval from the US government branch called the FCC. Without those licenses, Starlink is dead, just like 3% of the Starlink satellites that Musk already has launched into orbit. As a matter of fact, 30% of the original 95 units are now space trash, on top of polluting our night sky. So the question we have to ask is this. Why is the federal government funding SpaceX through NASA and enabling their launches through the FAA when Musk has already declared his intentions in writing to ignore national laws and international treaties by attempting to install himself as Imperator of Mars and declaring Martian independence? This is not a trivial question, and we already know that Musk has zero respect for the laws that apply to him. His past battles with the state of California, the SEC, and the FAA are all testament to his narcissism in such matters. In typical Musk fashion, he hasn't thought things through. He riles up his legions of faithful muskrats by acting as if he is beyond the reach of any government, the same governments upon which he relies for handouts, permits, and licenses. Apparently, his recent dealings with the Chinese haven't smartened him up at all either. And his muskrats find bravery in his false bravado, none of them acknowledging how insane he sounds by making those claims. There are, however, very simple solutions to a potential revolt among Martian colonists. 
you simply cut off the resupply support line from Earth and let time tick away. If you need to spin that somehow for the media, just tell them the supply ship was lost in space. 26 months later, NASA can launch another ship towards Mars with a fresh crew who toss out the bodies left behind on the surface and they carry on as normal. And if you really want to nip this in the bud right now and avoid these scenarios, stop funding Starship and licensing their launches. Cancel their lunar contract, cancel the refueling contract, and seize the technology SpaceX has that the US taxpayer paid for. If Musk plans on pulling this type of stunt in the future, whether or not he can actually get to Mars, put him out of business right now. Everyone is under the impression that Musk is self-funding this entire enterprise out of his reported vast wealth, not realizing every nut and bolt of SpaceX has been funded either through private capital raises or by the American taxpayer through NASA. Any money Musk put in at the startup was burned through long ago. If the government money ever dries up, SpaceX dies, and so do these ridiculous ideas dispensed by Musk. Tesla wouldn't be that far behind either if the government money, incentives, and regulatory credits went away. Which reminds us of a question about Tesla that needs to be asked. How is a company that has received massive financial assistance getting set up with billion dollar tax breaks in Nevada and a billion dollar built to order facility in Buffalo who enjoys buyer incentives through the federal government allowed to sell green regulatory credits for profit? Now we come to the debate about what kind of law we would expect to follow in outer space. There's a one year course offered at Duke Law School, as a matter of fact, debating Martian law in particular. And you would expect a law school to want to export their particular brand of jurisprudence throughout the cosmos, since the law serves no one so well as it does the lawyers. We are of the opinion that Shakespeare had the right idea, and an adversarial litigious society is the last thing that needs to leave planet Earth. There will be no time, manpower, or resources for extended trials in an off-world colony that needs to focus on surviving rather than meeting out punishments. And as it turns out, there is already a legal code and framework meant for quick determinations in use on Earth. The Uniform Code of Military Justice, where department heads are capable of handing out discipline for minor infractions and the captain or commanding officer heads up a tribunal for major offenses. But let's say someone is found guilty of extreme crimes, such as rape or murder. Then what? Let's say it's a murderer on trial. In such a closed system where everyone would have a designated task benefiting the collective good, the person who is killed leaves behind a vacant post, where those duties are no longer performed, and the person being incarcerated for the crime would leave another unattended. That would produce a strain on the remaining colonists, who would now have to work even harder to keep themselves alive, cover the unattended positions, and provide room and board for a prisoner who is no longer contributing to the overall picture. There is a very simple solution to half of that equation. Remove the convicted party from the population. Enact corporal punishment so that the new collective of 98 has a better chance of survival. And that would fall within the current Uniform Code of Military Justice under Article 118. Now on Earth, there have not been any military executions since 1961. However, the death penalty for premeditated murder or murder during certain circumstances is still on the books. And when the other 98 lives will hang in the balance, you can expect whatever rules they intend to use to be followed to the letter. Smaller crimes such as dereliction of duty or theft or various other misdemeanors would most certainly be dealt with using punishment details. And there will always be cesspits to dig out when people step out of line. In the UCMJ, this falls under Article 15. But ultimately, just as on submarines, in such a closed system, law and order would mainly be kept intact using a combination of peer pressure and mutual respect. Formally, the Navy has a code of ethics. In practice, disruptors and shit disturbers would likely find life to be quite miserable very quickly. So we are about 20 minutes into this and we haven't covered half the material we laid out, including the Martian colony economic structure. So we are going to stretch this out into part three. And when it's ready to go, you'll be able to click right here to see it. 